So we continue, um, we continue our reading of Bhagavad Gita. And uh, a, as you know, a kind of special reading of Bhagavad Gita. One that I find very inspirational. And one whose inspiration comes from directly from our Gurudev. And it's a reading that is trying to bring out the principles of bhakti in a book that, in a book, in a song that was created before the appearance of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, which teaches us in some way that the message of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was already there, waiting to be revealed to us, already there in the Vedic writings. In this reading, in our bhakti reading, we think uh, about, let's even say, Ragun, uh, Raganuga bhakti reading, we think about prema, divine love, as the foundation, as the basis of reality, as reality. Prema is reality. Divine love is the very highest, biggest reality we can have. Radha, Radha, Radha Govinda, do we don't have translation? No, no translation. No translation. Mm. And uh, Govinda Mohini, no, not come? I don't know. Okay, we watch. Sorry. So about the prema as a basic re basic reality, as reality itself. And then the idea that Radha Mohan is the highest manifestation of that reality, that prema as reality. So there are two points. And then a third point is that the, the highest thing we as jivas, as individual souls, can do is to vote, devote ourselves to this divine love, to devote ourselves to Radhika. And number four, then, the way to do that is to take on the mood of the Manjari, the Manjari Bhav. Take on the mood of the maidservant, of the goddess of divine love. This is our role in the great play of, of the universe. And these elements, we are trying to underline them inside Bhagavad Gita. This is our, this is our task. This is our, this is our goal. Just to remind you that Bhagavad Gita plays a, a huge role in, in, in Indian culture, in Vedic culture. We often say that in the Vedas, there are three big parts. The one is the Upanishads, some, the writings called Upanishads, the writings called Brahma Sutras, and then the Bhagavad Gita. And Bhagavad Gita is most popular because it, it's the the most full of ideas. It's full of philosophy and psychology and theology and spirituality. It's bringing us all these uh, elements in one. It's really a, a handbook for living. That's the kind of thing that Mahatma Gandhi said about it as well. It's a handbook for everyday living. It explains everything about human life, everything about human behavior, 
about feelings, about God, and our, about our relationship to other, other people. And by reading Prabhupada's, Prabhupada's translation and Prabhupada's commentaries, we can see how this handbook for living is filled with prema, is energized by divine love, by prema. That's what we're, we're seeking to do in this, this reading, which is directly, of course, I can't say enough, directly inspired by, by Gurudev. And for this reason, it's all the more important to, to pay our respects, like I insist that we do really every time, that we pay our respects to our Gurudev, give our obeisances, that we pay our respect to Param Gurudev, Radha Govinda, Radha Govinda Das Babaji Maharaj, that we think about uh, Prabhupada, Bhaktivedanta Prabhupada Maharaj, that we rem remember the, the Goswamis, the six Goswamis, and in particular Rupa Goswami, who formed, who translated the message of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in the first generation, and then Raghunatha Gaddas Goswami, who embodied it, who put it in his body and lived it out, suffering and joy and love and, and, and despair and all the, all the, all the moods and, and, and qualities of divine love Raghunatha Das Goswami shows us in his life and in his, in his, in his writing. As does Prabhupada Saraswati, uh, particularly in uh, Radha Rasa Sudhaniti, but not only. And then let's remember Ananda Das Babaji, the great poet who, who's brought us these writings. And then, of course, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself, Radha Mohan, the Acharyas, and you. I really think that's important. I spent some time on it last time, and I won't spend time today, but it's a, it's a gesture of respect that we think about the parampara. Yes, it's respect. But it's really practical, too. The presence of our Gurudev in our life helps us in a really practical, pragmatic way, as does the presence of, of the others in the Parampara. My Gurudev in my life helps me to listen to my feelings, shows me how to listen to my feelings, makes an example of someone who knows how to listen to his or her feelings. So it's very much a, a practical exercise, this parampara. It's not just abstract theory. It's not just respect out of some sort of heavy tradition. It's alive. To quote Gurudev, it's love in action. Bringing the parampara into our lives is love in action. So let's remember that it can help us every day in our practice, I think, and, and it's useful to bring um, that uh, into our, what I say, the, our consciousness uh, every time. Um, last time we, we started to read verse 4 from uh, chapter 9. We only just started it. So let me um, review just really shortly some of the things that were said there. First and, and most important, we started with faith. Faith, which is the, the basic idea from verse 3, that uh, we have to have faith in order to know Krishna was, was, the, was the verse. But then we talked about faith as a kind of knowledge. Um, faith as knowledge which replaces science, scientific knowledge. 
which replaces philosophical knowledge with spiritual knowledge. Faith is the kind of knowledge that comes to us through the soul, not through the mind. And this is important to remember because while knowledge, philosophical and scientific knowledge is very important, it's limited, it's finite. Spiritual knowledge is infinite. So spiritual knowledge is what we need to develop in order to understand our place in relation to God, our place in relation to divine love. The second point that, that we made about faith was that there's, a, there's an element of attraction in it, an element of, we often talk about greed, or hankering, or longing. Faith is being drawn towards um, knowledge, spiritual knowledge. It's not just passive, it's not just static. Govinda Mohini, are you translating? Okay, just one moment, I'll... I'll sign you up. And... There, it should be good now. Unfortunately, I've said all the important stuff. The rest of the class is just trivial. So I was just saying, just reviewing uh, the main points about faith, and then, I, then we'll move on to, to, to the verse four. Faith is a kind of knowledge, spiritual knowledge, which surpasses scientific knowledge or philosophical knowledge. Secondly, faith as a kind of attraction, something that pulls us from where we are in our material existence, pulls us out, pulls us up, pulls us towards God. The motor for this attraction is that little bit of divine love in everyone. The divine love in our hearts, that part and parcel of God's divine love, is not passive, not fixed, not, not cold or dead. It's alive, and it pulls us towards God. It pulls us towards spiritual knowledge. It pulls us towards Radhamohan. It makes us want to know. So when we talk about greed, as we so often do, we need to have greed. This greed comes from that grain of divine love that's in the heart of everyone. Everyone. No exception. We feel it differently each and every one of us, but it's there. The measure of our spiritual development is the amount of attraction or greed that is generated from that parcel of divine love in our hearts. So point number two, faith is attraction. And point number three was about the secret. This was the main theme in verse number two, when we talked about secret knowledge. The king of secrets, you remember. Raja Guria, it was called. Faith is the suspicion in our hearts that we can understand the meaning of love of divine love. 
that we can understand the secret, that we can have access to the way that Prema governs the world. This ambition is, is part of everyone's experience too. And just like, just like with the longing that comes from developed spiritual life, an insight into the secret of divine love grows too. So the more we develop in our spiritual life, the more we understand the secrets of the universe. The fourth point was that faith is a bridge. A bridge between <clears throat> the mundane, the material world, and the spiritual world. Between the mundane and uh, the divine, if, if you like. And the point I really like to make, and I tried to make last time, is that our access to the divine love, our ability to know it, to experience it, is not a matter of going somewhere else. I think I used the, the metaphor of getting on a train or a bus and, and going someplace where there's divine love. No, it's un wrapping, unfolding the divine love that's inside us. Right before he left uh, Munger Bandir, my dear Radha Govinda made me a beautiful gift. And uh, I only now understand how beautiful it was. It was a Russian doll. And you know what a Russian doll is, how that, how that looks. Inside the shell, the outer layer, there's another shell. Inside the material outer shell, there's an inner one, the spiritual one. And this is, the, this is the experience of the divine in everyone. It's already in there. I just have to learn how to open that inner shell and release it. Find my relation to God within my own self. So I think about that every time I look at my little Russian doll on my shelf in uh, Munger Mandir. But somehow it's not about leaving the body and going somewhere else, which is kind of the Judeo-Christian model or the Islamic model as well. It's about taking away the coverings that hide the divine within us from us. So faith is the experience of this connection between the mundane, between the material and the, and the, and the spiritual. That's there waiting for us. And this is why the, the role of, of guru and the role of other devotees, association, is so important. Because we learn this not by reading books, but by being together with people who know this. And then finally, the last point about faith was that... Uh, Faith is a, a promise. By this feeling that there's some little bit of divine love in us, there's a kind of loving promise that what I feel, this little suspicion, this little tiny feeling 
which is so immature. I'm such a child. It's just a little bit. It will grow. It will take place. So faith is also the way I'm, I feel it is a promise of realization. That this feeling that I have, it may be just tiny. Maybe it, I only feel it sometimes when I, when I look in the eyes of a baby and then it disappears. Or I see the sun setting and then it disappears. And I think, where is my spiritual education? I'm going nowhere. But this little feeling you have, when you, put a, when you put a piece of cake in your mouth and you feel that ecstasy, <laughs> that little feeling is the promise of the bigger feeling. It's this sort of loving hand. 1700 hours. It's this loving hand that pushes us gently forward and says that there is more waiting for you. Continue. Persist. Keep up your practice. Don't give up. So that was the important things about faith that, that I said, and I think it's okay to re repeat them a little bit. We talk about faith together with hope and love a lot. Faith gives hope. Hope is related to love. But what's most important to remember is that the foundation is the love. It's that grain of divine love in everyone's heart, which makes faith. And, they, and then faith brings us love. Okay, and then we had started with verse 4. And I can, uh, and I'd like to continue there and, and kind of, we only did one line or two of verse four. So let's, let's start right at the beginning of verse four and I'll put it up on the screen for you. Uh, if I can, there we go. There's verse four and the purport. No. So we started with the verse itself, which was which is a bit strange, and uh, Radha Govind even asked a very good question about it because it's it's uh, a bit contradictory. It says, as you see, my unmanifested form, which is this entire universe, is pervaded. Pervaded means it's full of something. So something that's not visible, it's unmanifested, is full of something. And what is it full of? Well, it's full of all the existing beings that we can see around us. But then Krishna says to Arjuna, all the beings are in there, just not me. Sorry, I'm not in there. All beings are in me but I am not in them. And this is kind of, a, kind of a riddle, at least I find. I think you probably do too. Huh? It means that Krishna is everywhere, but we cannot see him everywhere. Or at least in the mundane material world, we cannot see him everywhere. Materially, we cannot see him. When we say we can't see him, that does not mean that he's not there. It means that he's not visible, that he's not manifest. But he's not manifest in the material world, in the material form. 
in the spiritual form, in the material, in the spiritual world, he is manifest. He is visible. So, the true nature of the universe, the true nature of God, is invisible to us on the material level, but can be visible to us on the spiritual level. And how do we make our way to the spiritual level? This is what we learn in all the aspects of our practice of bhakti, through devotion, by creating a relationship to God, not a scientific one, but a devotional one, by creating a loving relationship to God and to the other jivas, who are the extensions, sorry, the expansions of God. When we let Prema be our North Star, our guiding star, when we let Guru be our navigator, then we find the path to to um, to um, to Krishna. Then we find then Krishna becomes visible to us. The second part of the verse is also a riddle. It says, all beings are in me, but I am not in them. All beings are in me, but I am not in them. Let's remember that in Krishna, there are, in God, there are many kinds of energy. One of these energies, we said it many times, and I'm going to say it many times again, <laughs> is Radharani, the energy of divine love. Just so that's said, that's not what we're talking about right here. But that's the most beautiful one for us. That's the one we desire the most. That's the one we love the most. Here, and it's described by Prabhupada elsewhere, there are two kinds of energy, and you know them. You have the Maya energy. The, it's called Maya Shakti. So the material energy, which is what Krishna uses to create the material world. All the things we see all the objects, all the, all, the, um, all the activities, the human activities that are happening in the mundane material world are created and partly animated through maya, through a maya shakti, a maya energy. That's the material things. Then there's also what is called jiva shakti, the energy of the individual soul, which is a higher energy than Maya, but not the highest. Okay, those are the two energies we're talking about here. That's not the important part, I think. The important part is that both kinds of energies are within Krishna. He has both of them and others. Um, so when we think about both material world created through Maya Shakti and the individual jivas created through Jiva Shakti, these are only part of what God is. They're part of it. They're partial expans expansions of him. The entire universe is much greater, including much uh, many other energies, the most important of which, I just said, is, uh, is divine love, is Prema, Radharani. We're coming back to her in a, in a moment. <laughs> so the infinite 
material universe is created and it's filled with many, many finite beings like you and, and me, finite souls, which are all expansions of Krishna, part and partial parcel of Krishna. But they're much less than what Krishna is. We could think of it this way. If we take the sum, collect all the, the jivas, if we collect all the material elements of the material world, all together put this, this would only be part of what Krishna is. But the universe is much more than this. Krishna is much more than this. This is why it says in the verse, all beings are in me, but I am not in them because I'm much bigger than them. I'm much more comprehensive than them. What is not said, and what I want to say, is that the most important part of what Krishna is, that is not in the material world, is divine love. So here we see once again in my reading, forgive me if I'm wrong, is the presence of Radharani, that energy which is divine love, in the creation of the universe. Laying there, waiting for jivas to discover, discover it as part of, of the universe. So we have maya, we have jivas, we have other energies, the greatest of which is divine love, is Radharani. She's there, but she's not part of the material world. She's part of the spiritual world. And so in maya and in the life of the jiva, we don't see her unless we undertake spiritual practice. What does Prabhupada then say about this? Let's move down, let's see. And we just started this last time and then we, I stopped quickly. We talked about the Brahma Sutra there and then we stopped. Prabhupada then, says then, the Supreme Personality of Godhead is not perceivable through the gross material senses. I think this is clear for everyone, probably. We cannot see, we cannot touch, we cannot smell, or hear <laughs> the Supreme Personality of Godhead. We cannot. It's unmanifested for us. So then we wonder, who can see, touch, smell, and hear the Supreme Personality of Godhead? Well, those who see, touch, and smell, and hear with their spiritual senses, they can perceive the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Those who live in their spiritual bodies, or perhaps visit their spiritual bodies, they can see what is unmanifested to those who live in their material bodies. Those who have found the path of loving devotion through the mercy of Guru, through the mercy of association and Sankirtan, those who have found their path to their spiritual identities, their Swarup, those are the ones who can see fully the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And when they see that, they see that it's Radhamon. Mm -hmm. 
That's why Prabhupada says in the next line, only to one who is engaged in pure devotional service under proper guidance, that is by Guru, is he revealed. Devotion brings us to God. And that loving devotion brings us to God because it brings us to Radhamon. Loving devotion brings us to the divine loving practice, which is Radhamon. Loving devotion, devotional practice doesn't bring us to a mechanical, sterile, cold, lifeless, tyrannical God. Devotional practice, building up our ability to give love, to feel love, to share love, that takes us to a loving God, a loving couple, a loving Yuga Kishore. Radha Mohan. So I really think I'm going a little bit far here in my interpretation. But I really think the, the space that is opened by Prabhupada, who says that by devotion we can get there, means that by devotion we can reach ultimate devo devotion which is a relationship to the loving couple, Radhamon. Then we followed, uh, then we went, talked uh, a bit last time about this, this beautiful verse from Brahma Samhita. And I already made the point, we won't read it again. What was so beautiful about it, and what is beautiful about all of Brahma Samhita, or at least the, um, the verse in chapter 5 that's recovered, is that it reveals the, 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 the essence of Radha Mohan already, even before Bhagavad Gita, and certainly long, long before uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So even though we don't have yet Manjari Bhav, which comes with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, we have evidence of God as Radha Mohan already in the Vedas. So we, we can, we talked about it that I think we said enough last time, but it's a beautiful poem. It's, it's really, I just discovered it myself in, in preparation for last week's um, class. Really recommend it to you. It's, 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 it's so surprising, so astonishing how it is. And like I say, I think, I think it really hints already uh, 2,500 years ago to the coming of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Okay, let's move then forward in the, in the, um, in the commentary, in the purport. If I can find the, if I can look at two. Yeah. So Prabhupada says, one can see the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Govinda, always within himself and outside himself. If he, and now I insist, sorry, I'd make a pause here. There's a, there's a non-grammatical problem here in this translation. The he, the second he, refers to the one. One can see, etc., etc., if one has developed, it should be. One can see if one has developed the transcendental loving attitude towards him. It's not Krishna, it's not God, it's not Supreme Personality of Godhead who develops the loving attitude. It's the devotee. So it's very uh, misleading. The he means one. 
and uh, himself means one as well. That's, that's the devotee. So let me rewrite it and re-say it correctly. One can see the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Govinda, always within oneself and outside oneself if one has developed the transcendental loving attitude towards him. For me, this makes 100 times more sense. That means if we devotees develop our love, our devotion, develop that little seed of divine love in our hearts, if we develop, develop it inside ourselves as a relation to ourselves, learning how to love ourselves, learning how to discover ourselves as natural-born lovers, to put it that way, a bit Hollywood, but okay, natural-born lovers, and if we learn to love outside ourselves, to love first and foremost our guru, but also to love our associates, our brothers and sisters, and to love our families and love our friends and love strangers. If we develop inside that love and outside that love, then there's nothing else to develop. The universe is structured like love. If we develop those two, inside, outside, we have become one with God, and He, God, becomes visible. Devotion, bhakti, devotional love, opens the door. It's already there. It's just waiting. It's not a hunting trip out in the forest. It's right here waiting. The requirement for seeing is devotion. A devotional love, the more we develop it, you know this because you practice, all you beautiful devotees, brothers and sisters, the more we purify the love in our hearts, by meditating, by associating, by singing, by kirtan, by dancing, by reading, the more the blockages disappear. Even we very young devotees like me, you can feel it in one day. You know what I'm talking about. You can feel when you open your heart, then some little bit of blockages fall away. The more you clean your heart, the more the blockages fall away. So it's a process really of, of surrender. Someone asked me about surrender after the last class. And that person was really right. It's a, it's a kind of surrender to that little bit of love we feel. The more we give ourselves into it, the more we understand. I'm writing just a personal footnote. I'm I'm working on a little book now about surrender, Sharanagati. And I'm doing it in France. And so I tried to find the word for Sharanagati in, in French. And uh, it's difficult. But the word I found, I'm not sure, the word I found is abandon like we abandon the ship we jump off the ship when it's sinking you know we abandon the ship and here when we surrender we abandon those old feelings that were blocking us we abandon those old blockages we abandon that old body that all those old ways 
we give up and we open. It's a very nice uh, way uh, of thinking about it. And this we do outside, like uh, Prabhupada says, outside of us, towards others, and inside of us, towards uh, ourselves. Uh, Prabhupada continues. Here it is said that all that although he is all pervading, although he is everywhere, everywhere present, he is yet not conceivable by the material senses. This purport, we understand. The divine cannot be seen with the eye, the material eye. It can't be smelled or touched or tasted. The material senses cannot have access. Because, why is that? Because the material senses are, are finite. I can only hear 100 meters. I can only see 300 meters. I can only feel to the end of my fingers. My material senses were created in time. In my case, they were created 60 years ago, approximately. And they will end in some more years. They're finite. They're in time. But as you know, the spiritual senses they can hear across the universe. They can see to the end of the cosmos. Right? They can taste and feel everything and everywhere. So making God present is the process of turning towards that the spiritual senses, the Siddha Deha. And with these, we can see the divine and taste the divine. And when we do that, there's immense pleasure. That's what's particular about bhakti. It's love we find there. It's loving pleasure, bliss. That's what we find. It's not just, oh, well, I can use my spiritual eyes to see really far, and I can be like the Hubble telescope, and I'm a great scientist now. No, I can use my eyes to see the most beautiful sights of the universe and feel the beauty of those beautiful sights in the universe. All by surrendering, all by sharanagati, all by abandon. And when Prabhupada talks about what gets in the way, there's all sorts of, we, like I said at the beginning, Bhagavad Gita is a psychology book, not just bhakti, not just theology, not just philosophy. It's psychology. And we have all these wonderful, terrible uh, mechanisms for stopping our progress. Social mechanisms, too. Uh, we say, no, not yet. Yes, I will surrender, but I have a few things to do first. I have to paint my house and and then I have to get another job, and then, then not yet, but soon. Or the psychology, the, the mind says, yes, but not too much. So 10% surrender, okay, which is not surrender. Or not now. Or not here, not here. I'm not, I'm not in a good place for surrendering. I better go somewhere else. All these knots, not here, not now, not this way, they're blocking us. They're blocking our own beautiful souls. They're saying no to our souls. You're looking in the mirror and saying no. And what is that? Look in the mirror and say yes. Yes. Yes is the primary word of the universe. Uh, surrender, and that's what we need to do. And I, I talk to you, but of course I need to talk to myself about these things too. I'm not, I'm not surrendered myself. So I, I, will, I live in the same limitations as, as you. 
Uh, we continue, and I'm watching the clock a little bit. I want to leave some time for for comments and and sharing. So I, we'll just finish this um, verse four. Prabhupada continues. He says, "As we have discussed, let me see if, as we let's see where does he continue." Mm. Oh, there, yeah, right at the top. Sorry, I'm a little bit blind. As we have discussed, he says, in the seventh chapter, the entire material cosmic manifestation. So the material world is only a combination of his two different energies that I talked about before, Jiva Shakti and Maya Shakti. But yeah, and the superior spiritual energy and the inferior material energy. This you understand, this you know. So Jiva is slightly superior, Jiva Shakti is superior to Maya Shakti. And then he uses this common, this example that we've heard many times about the sun. It's a very beautiful example of the way that um, God's presence spreads through the universe. And he says, just as the sunshine is spread all, all over the universe, the energy of the Lord is spread all over the creation, and everything is resting in that energy. And the energy is never diminished by being spread. But here comes the important point for us as Bhakta. Prabhupada says, Yet, one should not conclude that because he is spread all over, he has lost his personal existence. So we can easily think, well, God is spread like like butter over a piece of bread, nice and evenly and flatly, and therefore there's no personality. But there's no, if it's total, if it's perfect, then there's no variation. There's no personality, there's no particularity. But uh, I'm going to stop the screen just so I can see you a little bit, beautiful you. But he reminds us as well, Prabhupada, that um, Krishna is Bhagavan. And Bhagavan, you know, of course, is the version of God, one of the three versions of God, the aspects of God is a better word, that's personal. So we have Brahma, which is the absolute reality. We have Paramatma, which is the super soul. And we have Bhagavan, which is the personal part of God. So what does this mean? And let's see how this takes us back to Bhakti. Let's think about this. God has shape, form, flow, variation. And for Prabhupada, this is an old argument, you probably know, and we've talked about it before, an old argument with the impersonalists, the Mayaveda philosophers and others who think that, that God is Brahma, that it's absolute reality, it's just the reality as it is, homogeneous, fixed, solid, and absolute. But for Prabhupada, God is not everywhere and always equal. His presence varies. His intensity varies. Um, he's personal, he's changing, he's shifting, he's flowing, he's evolving. And how can that be then? What is the 
requirement for a personal God. If God is personal, what does that mean? It means that he's changing, he's flowing, he's evolving, transforming. What's making him transform? What's making him change? It's because God is subordinate to something else that's making him change. God is dependent upon something else. God is touched by something else. God is influenced by something else, impacted by something else. And you know what it is. You know where I'm going <laughs> with the reasoning, with the meditation. God is influenced by the love and the desire of Radharani. The impersonal aspect of God is the reflection of the eternal love affair with another, namely Radharani. The personality of Krishna, its, it's ebb and flow, its evolvement, ev evolution, its transformation, is the experience of the divine love, the love affair with the goddess of love, Radharani. And now you can just think of the Leela, which we hear, the divine love Leela, which we hear so much about when we're reading Vilapakus Manjari and Radharasa Sudaniti, and how love comes and goes and takes different forms, and Radhika has different desires and moods and personalities, and this extraordinary love affair has so many sides. And it's these sides that make Krishna to be a personal god not a, a flat, unchanging, homogeneous, constant, unitary, pure, absolute thing, but some, a God that's mad in his emotions for, for Radharani. So in the love games of Radharani, of Radhamohan, sorry, Radhamohan, the, the couple, the Kishore, we learn about all the different aspects that govern the personality of Krishna, that govern the personality of God. This personalism is the consequence, is the, is the product of not divine love, but of the divine loving, of the divine love affair. God is an agent of love. God is a soldier of love, a servant of love. Krishna is a devotee of Radharani. That's the explanation for the, the personality uh, of God. And I think uh, there are a few more lines in the purport, but I think actually that's such an important statement that I'm going to stop there and invite you to, to share your, your impressions and maybe Gurudev wants to react. And, I want to react. <laughs> My dear, you are great. Your name will be Peter Udhava, and uh, many, many, many will know you. You are a great soul. Mm. You have a mercy for two parts. You are talking uh, like he, he wants to say these things. Mm. I'm proud of you, my dear Peter Uddhava. <laughs> Why I say Peter first? Because they know you are American. <laughs> and you are also know that you are a friend of Krishna, who see him as a servant of Radhika. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gurudev. Thank you. Radhe, Radhe. Jai Ho. Radhe. I'm waiting to listen to you, my dear. Mm. Radhe, Radhe. Radhe, Radhe. Say more. You have a one-hour time, yeah. <laughs> Don't stop smiling. But I hope that um, someone else would like to share too. They can share. Gauravani is there. Govinda. Ah, Gauravani is Govinda. there. Hey, Radhe Radhe Baya. 
Radha Govinda, Rasika charge is there. Wow. Mm. Russian Rasika. Yes. Jai Ho. Radha Radha You are Bhakti professor, actually. I like the I like the PPHD. That was very nice. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. People will you are the person who melt my heart. Thousands of people will listen to you. Gorwani melt my heart. Thousands, thousands will go to you will see that. Yeah. Guru Dev, I'm at your service. Whatever you want me to I will do. serve you. Yeah. Krishna wants to serve Radhika. We want to serve the love. Who has the love to distribute? Yeah. Krishna is doing this to show, to, to serve, love us to serve. Who give the love, who vibrates the love. Vibration is what? Name vibration. What is that? Is a love vibration. Yes. It's a vibration of love. Absolutely. Hmm. Yeah. Gauravani Bhai, yeah, there are so many links to Chaitanya Charitamrita. Do you want to? No, first you say you have a time. <laughs> he will say, I want to listen more to you, though, and also Chaitanya. He will say, Gauravani, but please, linking. Yeah. Okay. This, this is we are searching for. We don't understand in Bhagavad Gita mm. that we are want to know, and you are giving this. Thank you. Okay, I'm, um, I'm now to so we go. We can continue. Finish the the verse here. It's, yeah. Um. Yeah, we talked about the two different energies. Balaam brings a big There. So we talked about, or I talked about this idea about him being spread and that he's not spread evenly he's spread unevenly through <clears throat> because his heart is unevenly engaged with with the loving pastime with of uh, with the radharani and then Prabhupada continues he says the same himself yet one should not conclude that because he is spread all over, he has lost his personal existence. And then the next line, he's, he continues that the Lord himself in the verse refutes the argument. So he's, he contradicts the argument. He says, I am everywhere and everything is in me but still I am aloof. 
aloof means, of course, separate, separate distanced or, and a little bit indifferent. I'm not caring entirely about 100% about what's going on. So it seems like a contradiction, a bit like the contradiction that Gaurachandra Bhaya talked about the other day, that, that, um, that Krishna is one and many at the same time. How can that be? It makes no sense. So I'm everywhere and I'm everything, but I'm also a part. But I think here too, I think here too we can, we can read this aloofness, the distance between where Krishna is and the material reality, which is everything. So all the material energy and all the material things that Krishna has created and the position where he is, the space in between, between the material and the spiritual, between what happens in the lives of the jivas and what happens in the lives of the spiritual soul, the spiritual form, spiritual beings, this is the this is Viraj. This is the playground. This is the place of the loving pastime for Radha. This place between which Raghunatha Das Goswami, for example, goes back and forth throughout Vilapa Kusmanjari. He goes between that material world on the banks of Radhakund and the spiritual world and the outside the outside the, the Kunj. This back and forth. The space between Krishna is both outside and inside. This space is the space of Raj. The space is the playground for the loving, um, the pastimes. And then he continues. I can put it back up. Let's see. So nice to see you. That's nice to share the screen, but it's nice to see your faces. For example, he continues, a king heads a government, which is but the manifestation of the king's energy. The different governmental departments are nothing but the energies of the king. And each department is resting on the king's power. It's a very useful example, don't you think? So the, the king can't do everything. The king can't be everywhere. But this energy of the authority, of the majesty, of the opulence is everywhere because it's an expansion of the king. So everywhere you go in a kingdom, the king is there. But at the same time, that's the paradox. At the same time, he's not there. He's there, but he's not there. Between where the king is in his siddhade and where he is felt in his material identity, that place is Braj. That place is the playground of divine love. The, the place between material pleasures and material experiences and divine pleasures. And so Prabhupada continues, still one cannot expect the king to be present in every department personally. That is a crude example, Prabhupada says. But there you can see anyway that the king is occupied with two different things. He's occupied with the material operation of the kingdom, collecting taxes, building things, fighting wars maybe. And he's also connected with this transcendental spiritual thing, which is his own majesty, his own uh, spiritual being, his own spiritual power. So he's occupied with the life of his material subjects and he's occupied with the life of his own soul. Back and forth, back and forth. Just as Raghunath Goswami goes back and forth from Radha Kund 
to the kunj. And it's in that space that the beauty of this, of this, of the lila takes place. Um, all that is not administering material power in the kingdom belongs to the, the play of emotions and prema and divine experience on the side of the, of the spiritual. And Prabhupada continues, similarly, all the manifestations we see, and everything exi that exists between this material world and the spiritual world, are resting on the energy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Everything that's between, everything that's between material and spiritual, that is resting on the energy, the energy of Radharani. The space of Raj is between, the space of the loving pastime is between. That is the energy of the personality of Godhead, where the personality can take form by experiencing the different sides of the loving relation. And Prabhupada continues, and then we will finish. The, the creation, the creation of the universe, of course, the creation takes place by the diffusion of his different energies. And as it is stated in the Bhagavad Gita, he is everywhere present by his personal representation, the diffusion of his different energies. What does this mean? This means when, when he expands into the material world through his energies, when he expands into the different jivas, when he expands into the different material objects, of course, a little bit of Krishna is in all that. Part of this energy that's expanding, part of this energy is the Radharani. So that part of divine love, that parcel of divine love that I said before is in you, is in me. That's the expansion of Radharani that came when Krishna created the universe. The force of expansion includes the expansion of Radharani. When, uh, when we say that we are the expansions of Gurudev, we are the expansions of that bit, we are also the expansions of that bit of Radharani, which comes from Gurudev, which is part of the experience of Gurudev, just like he is the expansion of the tiny bit of Radharani, Radharani's energy that uh, came to him from his own uh, Kurdev. So the, the material world is material. It's, it's our Sadika Deya. Our experience there is sadika, that of the, of the Sadika Deya. But nonetheless, we feel the suspicion. We feel the trace of an Radharani's energy in us. That's what we meant by faith, what I talked about at the, at the very beginning. We feel that little bit of, of Radharana in, in us, and that's because the energy that created the universe, all the different kinds of energies, from uh, Maya, Maya Shakti to Jiva Shakti to other kinds of energy, it includes the energy of Radharana, which is diluted in us and which is most pure uh, in the spiritual world and in the couple, in the, the couple Radha Mohan, Yuga Lakishore. There. So that's where I would stop with that verse. The verse uh, four. And I think, I think it's late to start on another verse, Gurudev. 
<laughs> are there any are there any questions now or or comments or sharing? Rade, Rade. Please. I was just thinking that actually in our case it's it's very similar. If someone um, owns something, his energy, when he is changing it, or let's say a house, you change a house, you put your colors, you put everything inside. So your energy is invested. That means you are there somehow first to your energy. And because you may be known as the owner of something, for example, the house, special mm. address. Mm. So then if it's going further and you invest love in that, you will be known even more, right? Because mm. if you're doing it very nice, then everybody will speak about this and say, oh, did you see what he did? With this house and so so then love comes in and energy is actually growing more but it's still not personal still it's not you hmm. but we can see that actually all this what krishna has and attributes and different energies is also in us it's also there hmm. So we are actually made after him, right? So it is said in Christian religion also, we are made after God. So we can actually see this in us very practically. I just had this thought and mm. I want to share it. Thank you very much. Mm. Thank you so much. That's a very good example. That's a very good example. We often talk so much like there's some big wall, a very thick wall between spiritual world and material world. But I don't think that's the right way to imagine it in our minds. Maybe the wall of our Russian dolls inside of us. But that we we're here together as devotees because we're already, the wall has already got holes in it. And, and we, we have an idea that there's something beyond. A lot because we see our Gurudev and we see his life and he teaches us and he makes an example for us and we see that there's something else. And then we find that in ourselves. But I think this wall is, is a bit of a myth, a bit of a legend, that, that somehow there's much more porosity, leakage, between the spiritual world and the material world. Of course, Krishna, the spiritual being, created the material world. So somehow already there's a connection. There was a flow of energy from Krishna, of Krishna to, to the material world, to the world of Maya. And uh, and this energy is also coming together with the energy of Radharani. We can't have it in the material world, but we can, like I say, the word suspicion, we have just a little enough a taste of there to know that that's what we want to go to, that we want to give our devotion to it, if we focus on that in, inside ourselves. I just get this picture that although that what you describe now we have also in our life very practical we can say in the house of our parents everything belongs to them the love is there everything is there full it's complete but if the child just want to play in the playing room then they can forget that they are there the love is still there Mm. As soon as they stop to play something where they are so much absorbed, maybe they remember, oh, the real cake doesn't taste like sand. 
<laughs> the real the real cake from Mama. Oh, it tastes so nice. So maybe we should look where Mama is. So in the same way, actually, it's described that 25% of the whole existence of the whole existence, not the material existence, the whole existence is under illusory energy. That means we think it's material. It's just the thought, because actually, it's just the false ego who is actually giving you this impression that it is material. Mm. 1800 hours. And uh, three quarters is completely in the exchange of love. Mm. Very so we can see it in this comparison, maybe uh, very clear, because it's very practical. It's also mm. in our world like that. And then if the child don't want to be with the parents, maybe there's somebody who's taking care of them. In our case, this is Nitai or Anangamantri. Mm. Mm. I like this. Thank you very much. The universe You're is not firing. The universe is not in equilibrium. The universe is not stable. The universe is tending toward divine love. It's tending towards prema. I promise you. It's not tending towards darkness or evil. And if we get out of the way. <laughs> It will go towards prema. This is even the natural way from the child, because child is learning by playing. What, what it learns? If the parents are very conscious, the child will learn how to love. This is actually the point. How to really love. Hmm. So this is the way of the flow. Yeah. So it's going to unconditioned love actually yes yes it should be even in our world like that yeah and it is as you say if we are not in the way yeah, yeah. and this is the meaning of what guru dev often reminds us that that he reminds us reminds us of what Prabhupada says in in chapter 18 of bhagavad gita about this is we're go we're all heading towards our natural position the natural position is prema is that's there's nothing unnatural about it there's nothing we have to be foreign to ourselves to accomplish we have to become ourselves our spiritual selves come become who we are not become somebody else and so this like a like a child is like you're saying um, garvani become the child again that's the natural starting point that we need to go back to. Oh, there came a question here from uh, Vandana. How can we get out of the way? <laughs> exactly. Good question. That's exactly the question. Thank you. And, and here I am, you know, floating around in America, like the, which is the land of Maya. It's almost as bad as Paris. So I'm not sure I'm the right person to ask. But I feel that getting out of the way of prema, it's um, acknowledging in yourself, it's looking in the mirror and saying, you know, you are prema. Instead of thinking, ah, I'm an engineer, or I'm a, I'm a father, or I'm a I'm a grocery shopper, looking at the mirror and saying, you are a divine soul which is made out of love. And when you really recognize that, when you believe that, then the block, then you're out of the way of prema. Then prema, the train of prema can continue its, its path along its way. When you finally realize that yourself, you are a soul, as, as Gurudev reminds us, the, the line from uh, Mari Magdalena, 
that you are a soul and everything that's important about you is your divine your divinity and your divinity is is love then the train just passes right through and you hop on and you and you're on the way so it's getting out of the way is is not being somebody you're not it's not trying to be more religious or more pious not trying to sing louder in temple or no more slokas it's being most who you are authentic to who you are and that should be the easiest but of course we know that that's very difficult we know that's very difficult so getting out of way of love is getting out of way of the false ego out of these constructions that you have about who you are and returning to the child in you okay then we'll stop here and i'll try to find my way through america this crazy place once again thank you so happy to see you i cannot tell you how much life and love it gives me just to see you see your beautiful faces and also to speak with you and so i'm very 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 grateful you are part of who i am when i get out of the way of for love tomorrow is your father funeral day tomorrow is all of so all devotees give condolence to your father i'm telling from his their side that you accept and pray for his soul from my side and all devotees praying and i to give their condolences to your father thank you very much thank you devotees thank you thank you all right i look forward to seeing you my dears next week stay in love radhe radhe